morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hello. And Kalimera. Kalimera. It is um, a pleasure to be here, but it's especially a privilege to be here because I wanted to um, start off on echoing the sentiment of uh, Stefan that the senseless acts of uh, violence against the innocent people in the Ukraine is really inhumane. And uh, my heart goes out to the people who are directly and indirectly affected and impacted by it. And I just hope, I think on behalf of all of us, that this war is quickly over. <laughs> and with that, it makes it even more of a privilege to be here physically together and also be safe. Um, and this actually turns out to be my first non-digital conference ever since I've become the Chief Digital and Marketing Officer in Unilever since uh, the 1st of January 2020. So that is a special occasion. And actually, the world has changed. The world has changed enormously since then. The way we work, the way we collaborate, um, shopping has changed, consumer behaviors and needs have changed. And I'm a firm believer of the fact that change brings great opportunities. Great opportunities for our businesses to grow, our brands to grow, but also for personal growth. But with these big opportunities comes also great responsibility. And um, today, over the next 20 minutes, I would like to set out my view on the changes ahead of us and also the responsibility that rests on our shoulders to continuously put people first in all the changes we're going through. Now, last year in Unilever, we've changed, we've changed our marketing approach and we've launched a new marketing philosophy and we called it Get in the Front Line. And basically, it's built on three principles. No matter how complex marketing seems to all of us, if you go back to these three principles, we truly believe you always be, will be successful. The first one is Get Real. Get Real. Use data and empathy to really understand the consumer needs and consumer pain points to identify these and solve them. Second, do good. Make sure that your brand has the right value proposition, but also stands for the right values to spur positive change in this world. And then thirdly, be unmissable. Stand out in culture, be effortless to buy. So the short, the short sentence that I keep in mind is, first to find, first to mind, first to find. And actually, that's the way I wanted to get started today. Let's get real, what's happening with consumers? And instead of giving you a full overview of all the changes that are happening, I've selected two, two that I want to highlight today. The first one is sustainability. You heard Stefan talk about it. And why? Because sustainability has become mainstream. People have seen over COVID times more and more how their personal actions really have an influence on people and planet. And the second one is the digitization of people's life, the acceleration of it. And I think lots of things have been made possible due to that. But let me first get into the first one, sustainability. As I said, sustainability has become mainstream. And we are really witnessing a rise of the considerate and conscious consumer. And that's only signals that brands will be chosen more and more for value and values. And in Unilever, we call brands that stand for values and values, brands with purpose. Now, let's not get mistaken by it, because in the end, purpose is not a substitute for a great value proposition. It all starts with a great value proposition, so a fantastic product, a superior product against the right price. And especially in these times of hyperinflation, we see that the value equation becomes even more important. But once you've got your value equation right, it is necessary, in our view, to really think about values. And that is not easy, because values need to be authentic to the brand. They need to be uh, based on the product truth and the category benefit. But once you've got it right, you've got the ideal combination of value and values, the dual nature of value comes into play, and then you found your, your flywheel of growth. And what for me personally is even more important, then we get consumers on our trajectory to really make sustainable living commonplace. Because at Unilever, we really believe that brands with purpose last, brands with purpose grow, companies with purpose last, and people with purpose thrive. 
Now, on to the next one that I wanted to talk about, digitization, and this will take a little bit more time. Changes in digital consumption, amplified by everything that is happening, are really changing uh, the way that we live, play, and shop. And it is enabling us nowadays to not only reach long-term or short-term objectives separately from one another, but we can reach marketing and sales objectives, long-term, short-term, all at the same place at the same time. Because this is not news to you, but commerce channels have become media channels, and media and entertainment channels have become commerce channels. So what we see is that the consumer is changing, we see that shopping is changing, we see that marketing is changing, we see that sales is changing, and that's why Unilever is changing. And actually that's the reason why from the 1st of April, I'm no longer the chief digital and marketing officer, but I've now become the chief digital and commercial officer. And before you ask me, no, we're not dropping marketing, but we're adding sales. And the reason for that is that the lines between marketing and sales are actually really blurring now due to digitization. They have been blurring if you think of things like net revenue management, if you think like category management, if you think about e-commerce even more so. But now we really see that this convergence of media, entertainment and shopping and commerce has been taken to new heights. And we truly believe there's more growth opportunities out there if you consider marketing and sales in one hand. And that is only happening whilst Basically, the biggest change is yet to hit us, to hit us all, all, and hit in a positive way, because that is the next iteration of the internet. And the next iteration will bring new behaviors, new economies, new opportunities, because if you think how big this will be, just in the US, I uh, lately read that they're expecting the metaverse to be an $8 trillion business and in 2024 already, an 800 billion investment will take place in Web3. So this will continue to accelerate. And basically, um, that, that makes that we really need to think smartly about the way that we're going to build Web3. We have a window of opportunity. We have a window, or an opportunity to act. And that opportunity is now. But we're only starting to create, we're only scratching the surface of Web3 at this moment in time. So we have a window of opportunity to act now. And while we don't exactly know what all the questions will be and the unintended consequences of Web3 that will come up, we are starting from a position of foresight because we also have a backlog of issues of Web2.0. What are those issues? Well, don't need to tell you. This is what it clearly shows misinformation, disinformation, increased surveillance, data privacy issues, ad fraud, harmful content, uh, brand safety, you wanna hear more? <laughs> ad fraud, ad brand suitability. So these things have happened. And one thing we know for certain, that if personal data gets even more personal in the new environment, these challenges will be amplified. If we have biometric data, fears, desires, conscious and unconscious biases, that can all be captured and it can all be analyzed and can all be ma manipulated, we really need to think, think twice. And if we just think about what girls and women are exposed to at this moment in time, we know that 76% of girls globally have been abused online and become more private because of it on the internet. 70% of women don't want to run for public office because female politicians are not treated well online. And 90% of all deep fakes are pornographic images of women used without consent. And we are already hearing the first signs of things that are happening on Web3. We've heard the first reports of harassment on Web3. We've heard harmful and uncomfortable things happening that only get amplified in that environment that is in virtual reality. And imagine what's gonna to happen to our children, the children that grow up being Web3 natives. We really need to think that through. It cannot be, Web3 cannot be a mistake that the next generation needs to pay for.
So do we truly understand the effects of mass adoption of these experiences in virtual reality? What they will have as an effect on society, on our children, on our relationship, and our sense of self? And do we understand another aspect of it, the impact it will have on the environment? Digital technology is now accounting for 4% of greenhouse gas emissions. And it is more than the entire aviation in industry. And a single transaction of Bitcoin has the same carbon footprint as 680,000 credit card transactions. So this is the moment to start to really understand, avoid where possible, mitigate if we can't, these damaging yet unintended consequences and collectively drive system change without paralyzing innovation. Web3 can't be tomorrow's problem to solve. Together, we need a shift in mindset from solving problems to preventing problems. And we need to act, not later react. We need to prevent before we need to treat and we need foresight instead of hindsight. Now, the promise of a decentralized, interconnected internet that is user-defined is catching the attention of everyone, basically, whether you talk about governments, NGOs, creators, innovators, um, all of us. And it actually follows a line of tech inventions that we have seen over time. 30 years ago, the internet didn't even exist. And look at where we are now. First Web 1, where we basically use the web to read content um, and access to information was being granted to everyone. Then Web 2, a more of a rise made possible on creating and posting content, the rise of the data-driven economy largely led by cloud, social, um, and mobile. And now on to Web3, a decentralized, interconnected space where people can own the internet. And everybody's sort of saying that at this moment in time, the adoption rate, the adoption curve of Web3 is at similar levels as we were with Web2 in 1998. And to put that in perspective, the founders of big businesses that will flourish via Web3 are basically now girls in the year five. So if you really think about that, that is almost unimaginable. But we also can't wait. It's time to act now. And we need to start experimenting and to learn more about what this takes and what are the consequences of it so that we can indeed act. So at Unilever, we have started. We started experimenting. And um, we started first, probably like many of your companies that you work for, in gaming. Gaming is the epicenter of community, culture, and commerce. And one of our premium brands, I'm going to show you a couple of examples. Um, and one of our premium brands, Tatcha, has created Tatcha Land in Animal Crossing. Hopefully you're all aware of that. And it was used to launch a new product. Now let's take a very quick look. Good morning, guys. Today is an exciting day because it is Animal Crossing Day. Today we are streaming Tatcha Land and it's finally the day. So much to Tatcha for having me at their new little Tatcha land, which is in celebration of the new rice wash. It launched today, so be sure to check it out. I really, really, really like it. And it's not only used for product launches. We also uh, did an experiment with recruitment. Because of COVID-19, we couldn't have physical on-location recruitment uh, fairs. And that's why we've changed the approach to it. So Pot Noodle hosted an AR-led event, um, a career event for students. And the really good thing is that we had plus 400% attendees and five times as many job applications. So this shows how much the younger generation is already emerged in this world. And then on to health uh, appointments. Probably the people uh, in the audience who are coming from Asia know Lifebuoy really well. Lifebuoy, a big brand of Unilever. And over the recent years, Lifebuoy has been able to help more than a billion people um, keep germs at bay by adopting better hand washing uh, uh, habits. But getting seen by a doctor is really a challenge across the world. If you only think about a, a statistic that even uh, that blow me off is that in Vietnam there's eight doctors for 10,000 patients, and in Indonesia it's three doctors for 10,000 patients. 
And then Lifebuoy thought, we can do something about this if we use technology. So they teamed up with telemedicine uh, providers in India, Indonesia, Vietnam, and this expanded the reach of this virtual service. And the brand continues now to scale up and make sure that uh, we further democratize healthcare. And just imagine what the possibilities would be in Web3, where you can really, in virtual reality, visit a doctor, get immediate advice, and no need to travel, and how many more appointments doctors can make. On to the next one. Uh, we're also experimenting with promotions. And this is an example of Magnum, and I just want you to know this is with full consent of our consumers. Let's take a look. The body gives you away when you lie, when you are nervous, when you are afraid, but also when you feel pleasure because it exposes and reveals your wishes with small details, the micro expressions in your face and pupils. It is proven that they can increase up to 30 times in size when you see something you like. So we decided to put that pleasure to the test, introducing the face of pleasure, an interactive dynamic with our consumers. We developed an algorithm that detects the level of pleasure that you feel towards a stimulus. Using a very tempting video, we invited people to prove how much they wanted a magnum. While playing the video, our algorithm scanned and measured the pupil dilation and 17 other micro expressions through the cell phone's camera. This way, we were able to measure the level of pleasure and turn this data into a discount. For the first time, we used a variable data set to determine the percentage of discount according to people's reactions. The more you wanted a Magnum, the more discount you could get. Another example. Uh, I can't walk off this stage without having mentioned NFTs. And this is uh, our Sunsilk brand, or Elidor. And this brand is on a mission. A mission to make sure that girls can fulfill their dreams um, without being limited by societal norms or stereotypes. And this is actually an artwork, an artwork that the brand commissioned in Turkey. And it's a beautiful reminder for girls to really dream big. Now, it's been transformed into an NFT, and then it was traded on OpenSea. And all the proceeds of the sales went to NGO partners to help girls learn new skills. These examples are just a couple of examples I took with me, and they cover the range of promotions, product recommendations, recruitment, innovation. And it is clearly a signal of the commercial opportunity that is ahead of us in Web3. But as I said in the beginning, I also believe that with these big opportunities come big responsibility. And if we want to live up to the opportunity of Web3, we must do so with our eyes wide open. A true technology evolution must be accompanied by the development of a substantial new ethical infrastructure and policies. Because regulation alone isn't enough. Self-regulation alone isn't enough. Self-restriction is not enough. And if safety isn't coded in from the outset, it will be much harder to secure it down the line. So Web3 must be thoughtfully designed with the highest principles of ethics, transparency, and choice. Because the internet without trust is scandal. And as advisors and advertisers, we need a framework. We need a framework for responsible and ethical media investment to earn the trust and the respect of people who choose our brands. And back in 2018, uh, to help address some of the challenges in Web2, in Unilever we announced our responsibility framework. And we noted that we needed to create a safer, more trusted digital environment for society and also for our brands. And that's why we launched a framework based on three pillars. It is responsible platforms, responsible content, and responsible infrastructure. So what does it really mean? Responsible platforms, we committed to not invest in platforms that do not protect our children or create division in society. We committed in responsible content to tackle stereotypes, 
and to really tackle stereotypes through the Unilever initiative of hashtag and stereotype, and then championing it across our industry with the UN Women's Hashtag and Stereotype Alliance. And then lastly, responsible infrastructure. Committing to partner with organizations who are determined to create a better digital uh, infrastructure. And we now need to unite. We now need to unite for Web3 around common standards for creating shared immersive worlds, including interoperability, to allow freedom of movement and freedom of goods across the virtual world. So what do we need? We need regulators and governments to create the space for innovation and learning alongside clear boundaries and a clear framework and an enforcement of accountability. We need advertisers. Advertisers to invest responsibly in partners, in content and in infrastructure. We need tech, tech to design with ethics, inclusion and safety coded in from the offset and rapid innovation to address the energy consumption that I just showed required to mint tokens and coins. And we need people. We need people to co-create and build trust coming together online. Because in the end, the currency in Web3 is not crypto. The currency is trust. And to close off my session, the rapid digitization of economies and society has connected us in previously unimaginable ways. However, we also know that this rapid pace of growth has led to an evolved business model and algorithms that reward attention. And this has allowed many bad practices and harmful actors to slip through, leading to unintended consequences, contributing to online and real life harm. Now, Web3, we're just scratching the surface, as I said. It will come with booms and busts and lots of experimentation, just like we saw actually in the 90s. But this time, we enter with foresight. We have learned. We have learned so much from everything that's happening at this moment in time. And I truly believe if we collectively put our shoulders behind it, and we want to really make sure that the consumer is back in control of their own data, this can all happen. Consumers need to be in control of their data. They need proof of ownership. They need control of what their data is used for and how it's being monetized. And the positive thing is we have a window to act. We need to avoid to react. Because in the end, it's people, it's not technology, that will measure the success of our efforts.